I guess maybe you were wondering if you dialed into the uh, wrong Louisiana Professor Long Hair. I got the long hair, the balding, I got the goofy glasses, but I do not play piano like that. <clears throat> Interesting message there from Professor Long Hair. That's who that was. I actually don't remember his real name. Uh, but interesting lesson about uh, making do. And I guess that's kind of what we're doing. We're learning to make do and we'll probably be stronger for it and maybe create some new things out of it. Well, um, welcome. I have spent the last few days being a little bit under the weather. Um, and uh, sorting, 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 sorting. I wanted actually, I, I guess I should say I've been shuffling. I've been shuffling PowerPoint card decks of slides, trying to put them into, uh, you know, trying to distill a lot of information about polymers uh, into something that we can use in, in this class. So um, hopefully that will go well, and uh, we'll see. I think we want to slide down here to wherever it was we ended, and we will uh, begin. Okay, that's our goal. Uh, we want to convince you that it's at least technically possible to do it. And uh, that's not obvious. I mean, most of the molecules you have encountered, you know, just pick one, methanol, ethanol, methane, <coughs> benzene. We give you the formula, you know, benzene, C6H6, you know right away. 6 times 12 plus 6 times 1 for the hydrogen, you know, total molecular weight of 78. You see, we can't really do that for polymer science. Nobody really knows how many repeat units there are, and they're not always the same uh, in every molecule anyway, so you get these crazy averages, and which average you get depends on which technique. But that's why we have to have those averages in the first place. I'm often asked, why do we have to have these stupid averages? And it says that, that those cer certain techniques that we use to measure this thing uh, actually, uh, actually uh, come out of certain uh, techniques. So let's see if we can get through that now and still have that going on. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. I think the next slide. Apparently, we're just not going to have the keyboard today. I want to talk uh, first about uh, osmotic pressure as one of the methods that's used to do this. This method isn't used that often anymore because it's a kind of pain in the neck. I don't even know if Georgia Tech has one. I came from Louisiana State University, as you can see all from the Louisiana references. Um, and uh, they have very good polymer characterization there, too. I do not think they have an osmometer. I used to own one. I threw it off the top of the building once, kind of got frustrated with the thing, and time for it to go. Uh, the only person I ever saw make it work was uh, an alcoholic, and he can only do it when he gets drunk. I have a good story about that, I can tell you. But anyway, <clears throat> this is a, I guess what I want to do is convince you first that if we had the, the ideal gas law, which everybody remembers, uh, one of the significant things about it is that it allowed us to measure molecular weights back in the day when you didn't just feed it into a mass spectrometer and get that molecular weight. Um, I showed you, the thing I showed you with all the peaks and spikes in it is from a mass spectrometer, but two things. That won't always work, okay? So uh, that's actually rare that it works, uh, and it usually works better for small molecules, for small polymer distributions. It works better than it does for large ones. Um, and the other thing is that we didn't always have it. So uh, it's really not that popular for measuring molecular weights of large polymers. So anyway, um, in the back in the day before mass spectrometers, even small molecules had their molecular weights measured through this ideal gas law, which seems seem kind of crazy. I don't even know if they teach you that anymore. Uh, I don't think I was really taught that all the way, you know, made aware of it anyway. Um, so in here, of course, P is the pressure, uh, V is the volume, R is the gas constant, T is the temperature, N is the number of, of moles, right? Uh, and what that is equal to is the number of grams over the molecular weight. We'll just call it M, because we're going to talk about you know gas 
some small modules or gates or something like that. Okay. So uh, actually, rather than write number of grams, let me just write G over M. Right. So G over M for number. G would be the number of grams. So so with that substitution, uh, and I'll do a, a little. Uh, I'll bring the V onto the right hand side too. I'll uh, have uh, G R T and then I'll have uh, M V. But let me write them backwards. Okay. And uh, then I'll define little c to be G over V. This is the grams uh, per usually milliliters, but per volume concentration. OK? So I could write, you know, the ideal glass law can be written as P is equal to CRP over M. And then, of course, I just have to rearrange that to get M, which I'm probably out of space. So I don't, really, I don't know if that will really work. but you. I'll just write here, get M from rearranging that CRT over P. Well, incredibly, um, this same relationship for gases uh, works in solutions, too. Uh, the, 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 the catch is that it's the osmotic pressure that you measure. Okay. And what this is is... Um, is uh, the, the, the pressure difference uh, that exists um, from the left side of the chamber. Here's the left side. So this is, uh, uh, this is solvent only. And this one is solvent plus polymer. OK. <clears throat> And so the, the, the semi-permeable membrane here is designed to only pass the solvent. The solvent molecules, the little dots in here, the solvent can go on all over. But the little dots can go either side. They go through the membrane. Now, these are made usually of regenerated cellulose or something like that. And so the solvent molecules can, you know, they can hum back and forth between the sides. They're happy. But they get a little more entropy if they go to the right-hand side. They get a little bit more entropy by going off to the right-hand side because then they can mix with the polymers and you create uncertainty about whether it's a polymer or a solvent molecule in a given location. So uh, that kind of uncertainty is a disorder, and disorder is entropy. So, you know, it happens. So the solvent does go over there. But opposing that is uh, a, a, a pressure, and that pressure, pi, is equal to the density of the solvent times the gravity um, times this height h, which is the height between the right side and the left. So conceptually, that's how an osmometer works. That's not how they, they actually work. That would take forever. Um, but what you do instead is you actually apply a pressure here until you stop the flow from left to right. But that's a technical detail. So at least in principle, you can get a molecular weight from osmotic pressure. Uh, it turns out that osmotic pressure you get MN. If you deal with a polydispersed solution, you get M sub N. Um, the reason nobody does osmometry anymore is because it's gotten easy, cheap, and fast to do light scattering. And uh, it's not, not obvious, and it really shouldn't be. I mean, we could try to make it obvious if we wanted to, but uh, we won't. Um, it's, it shouldn't really be in, uh, it's entirely obvious, I think, to you that um, light scattering gives the same information. Um, if you think about it, though, uh, just to make it a little bit better, if you um, think about what's happening in the osmometer, on one side of a chamber you have no polymer, and on the other side of the chamber you have polymer. So you really have a fluctuation in concentration, okay? And uh, those fluctuations exist naturally. They're very small. 
So inside of this solution here, I'm trying to draw some polymer molecules, many of them, zillions of them. <clears throat> and overall, their concentration is the same anywhere you look in the solution. But if you zoom in, so that's what magnify means, we'll zoom in, and we look very carefully, we will see these little fluctuations in concentration here. See, I'm trying to draw what I already have drawn. And these concentration fluctuations cause scattering of light. Now, there's a, they're small. Those concentration fluctuations are normally small. So there, notice that there is a, a, a split in the, in the y-axis here because you really have to zoom in a lot uh, to see that uh, change in the concentration. But it turns out that light scatters, uh, scattering happens off of those concentration fluctuations, and it's almost like a bragg scattering. We want, we'll come back to bragg scattering. From an, an equation point of view, um, uh, the relationship is that the inverse of the scattered light intensity is proportional to the compressibility. Uh, I'm sorry, the compression, the uh, sort of like the osmotic modulus of the system. How much pressure do I have to apply to achieve uh, a concentration fluctuation? How much d pi do I need per dc? The experiment itself is that you aim a laser at a solution and it scatters light off in that direction. Uh, we have a lot of those at Georgia Tech uh, in, in my lab and in many other labs. You'll see quite a lot of those at Georgia Tech. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, light scattering is one of the ways that you, you get this. And uh, un unlike osmotic pressure, um, light scattering uh, gives you uh, the weight average molecular weight. And it's actually more sensitive Ooh, out of space there. It's more sensitive as the molecular weight increases. Okay. And if I was to go back to the uh, previous slide, I could mark that. That osmotic pressure is the opposite of that. So those are two methods that we'll sort of discuss to make it seem uh, possible. I do need to mention that there are some others. Um, and all the ones that you see here are what are called absolute methods or primary methods that if you had a polymer, you could get its absolute molecular weight. Uh, some of these are more convenient than others and depends on the situation and depends on the molecular weight and cost factors, how badly do you want to know, kind of what it comes down to sometimes. Uh, for these reasons, it's been um, popular uh, to uh, develop methods that are called secondary methods. And uh, we'll begin with one that uh, actually starts with a riddle. Uh, and it's kind of <laughs> appropriate, a little bit of too close timing right now, uh, but we often have this situation in Louisiana and other places have rivers too, I guess, with storms. Um, actually, it turns out that uh, rivers are fairly gentle in Louisiana, most of them, uh, because there's no hills. <laughs> so a flood here doesn't mean the same thing as a flood uh, in Atlanta. There's not much rushing water. But anyway, uh, we can imagine uh, there's a uh, some sort of problem and uh, some trees are knocked down into a river and a dog and a cow both fall in and the question is who comes out first? Um, cow or dog? And uh, the answer is actually in this case cow <laughs> uh, because the trees aren't blocking the river. If the trees really blocked the river maybe the cow would get stopped but you see what actually happens is the trees kind of half block the river. So the dog can actually swim and not because he's a dog and has opposing thumbs or anything like that, opposable thumbs like humans. Uh, but anyway, he can kind of get into the tree. He can kind of get there, and it turns out that the water flows more slowly through the tree than it flows around it. Uh, nobody would have any question, any problem with that if I said uh, boulders in a river, um, the water as it flows between the boulders is definitely going faster, right? Uh, definitely flows more quickly between the boulders. But it's also true of something fairly porous, like a tree, or like a chromatography stationary thing. 
So we imagine that we throw a cat through a tree uh, is kind of the situation we have here. And uh, what we're doing this GPC experiment, gel permeation chromatography, that's what that stands for. And I still call it that. Um, and many people do. Uh, other people have other names for this. Uh, one of them is size exclusion chromatography, SEC. But of course, uh, this is really a, a better acronym for the Southeastern Conference uh, for football purposes. So anyway, we'll just leave that alone and we can ask the all-abiding question, what does ACC stand for? For Is it Atlantic Coast Conference or is it almost competitive conference? I can never remember. Um, but anyway, uh, if you put a large um, molecule into uh, this sort of situation, and uh, it may seem like it's blocked and should get filtered out, but in fact, in three dimensions, there are interstices in here. And so it's actually going to come out faster than the little one does. Okay, uh, there's some information is lacking from this. But anyway, you can actually separate uh, the polymers, and that's kind of keen because that means that if you have a polydispersed distribution, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on if you don't have to look at all of them at different sizes at once. You can sort of separate certain sizes and uh, just sort of focus on certain sizes. So this is an important technique. It's uh, hugely and commonly used. Um, this is a student I told you about that went off to work at a company called Albemarle uh, Ibuprofen. I think ibuprofen, I think they still own that patent. Uh, they uh, historically have done a lot of polyolefins and uh, chemistry related to production of polyolefins as well. So this is a company, I think a Virginia-based company, but he is in the Baton Rouge office. And Wayne came up with this wonderful analogy of how uh, GPC works. It's kind of sad. I hope somebody got uh, the little ducks out of there. But uh, anyway, the big duck came out first and the little ones are Let's assume they do come out. They, they, if they did, they came out later. And uh, <clears throat> I'll encourage you to watch this video. Um, I think I've got it figured out that if I did watch it, you would see it now. We could, could try that, but um, we'll give it a try. Let's just see what happens. Who knows what will happen? This is from the people who make these machines. Came up with this video. Kind of a piano theme today, don't we? That's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so now we have an organ theme, and I don't know why it has to be so dramatic. But here comes some big molecules along with some little. And you see the big ones kind of going by. The little ones getting sucked in there for a little bit, but they like. Fusion will work their way out, uh, maybe, or, or just sort of slowly flow through eventually. And uh, you see them over here on the right being uh, separated out according to size, which they've color coded. I think that's enough of that. Let's see if I can get out. Yes, I can. You know, I never know what's going to happen. All right. So uh, that's size exclusion chromatography, and uh, what it way it works is uh, basically um, you wind up uh, comparing uh, how long it takes your polymer uh, to come out compared to some that are known. So you still need the absolute methods uh, to calibrate your system. So if you had, let's just say, for the sake of Arguments say polyethylene oxide as your standards. Okay, you buy yourself some standards. That means somebody did the careful absolute measurements on the polyethylene oxides, figured out how long it takes them to come out through that column like that, according, you know, at different sizes, different electrolytes in them. 
And then you run your sample through and you say, oh, mine comes out about the same as the 2,000 two molecular weight PEO or the 20,000 molecular weight PEO standard. And so then yours must be that same. Uh, the deficiency of this technique is that it really only works well if your sample is chemically identical to the standard. <laughs> so that's, so that's a kind of a problem in some in some cases. Uh, not so much for industry, because they generally make the same polymer every single day. All right, uh, I didn't meant to skip that. We'll come back, uh, talk a little bit more about size later. That should probably have been skipped. Uh, part of this talk is about classifications of polymers. Uh, I'm just going to show you this one. Uh, kind of oddly and totally by accident, this is was made by that same company, Albemarle, where Wayne was working. Uh, this is a, 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 an example of a polymer that does not contain any carbons in it, or doesn't have to. I guess there could be some carbons in these R groups, and I think the R groups are top secret, or at least were. Uh, some of this was developed uh, by the U.S. Army, and it was a crying shame that they didn't give that technology to the scientists at NASA, uh, because if they had, we very likely could have avoided that uh, challenger uh, explosion because uh, one of the things that uh, this polymer does is make a terrific rubber and it's a rubber that doesn't get uh, hard uh, at very low temperatures so the, the army right there you see it's some army tank trying to fight in the desert but trust me we want them to work on the plains of Siberia just as well I don't think we're ever going to get a tank over there though. but we want them to work in northern Europe and um, other cold locations and you really don't want the gaskets uh, in these tanks uh, to, to get hard because the polymeric materials get hard as the temperature goes down. And that's actually called the glass transition. And we're going to talk about that plenty. Okay. Um, so uh, this was a superb rubber. And, uh, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing in the U.S. government. And so the Army didn't tell NASA about this. NASA used inferior materials for its O-rings, which were always a bad idea to have those O-rings, by the way. <clears throat> and uh, as a result, uh, they launched a Challenger mission on a cold day because Ronald Reagan wanted them to. And, um, well, off uh, the thing blew up on them. People died. Uh, Copolymers. Um, boy, this has become a huge thing. And, uh, of course, it's something that we're very good at doing now. Um, uh, it's a, a chemical marvel chemically it's a marvelous thing. Uh, the reason we do it is because um, you could design a homopolymer. You could take a, a, a you could say, I want a I want a polymer that's very hard and tough and strong, you know? Um, and another guy would say, Well, I want one that's very soft. Okay? I need it to be soft for that low temperature gasket. Uh, but you're not going to build a whole chemical factory. You saw the scale of the chemical factories that we build. Now, you're not going to build a whole different chemical factory just for one kind of polymer or another. Uh, so what you really want to do is be able to tune these properties, ideally using the same chemical factory. <laughs> and so what you can do, one way to do that, is to put a hard segment in and a soft segment in. And the hard segment uh, you know, gives you kind of strength. And the soft segment can give you the kind of toughness. Uh, anyway, you can have uh, this one on the top is a block copolymer. So that's a block copolymer because you got a whole block of hardened and then a block of soft. Now you can have random copolymers. You can put, put those in there randomly. And then you can have graft copolymers. You can just hang them off the sides. And uh, what kind you get is uh, all depends on catalyst. Okay, so um, the uh, inorganic chemists work very hard to uh, control catalyst design. The most famous of these that I ever knew, actually, yet again, was a guy who worked at Dow Chemical. And I think he was probably easily, you know, 400000 a year or more. Uh, it didn't really matter to him. What mattered to him is he had a research budget on an annual basis. He controlled a research budget of $700 million. So that's approximately the same as all the research that goes on at um, 
sorry, I think that well exceeds what goes on at Georgia Tech. I was going to say Georgia Tech. Uh, we may be pushing, be pushing a billion in research, but he was pushing about a billion in research in his own group, okay? And he was catalyst design guy, okay? And so they make a lot of catalysts, and uh, they test them, and they make polymers, and uh, he could take polyethylene and polypropylene and make them be hard, soft, um, different lengths, uh, different melting transitions, different glass transitions. Again, we will come to that. Um, all out of the same factory. And that's why they paid him so much money. Okay, uh, so uh, there is a sort of nomenclature that goes uh, with these copolymers. Uh, I don't really care about that. So I could almost take that slide out. Um, Again, an another class of polymers that we want to talk about is star, letter, brush, and more. There's different kinds. Uh, star polymers, I think, pretty obvious that they should be sort of branched. Um, this is a four-functional, so F here is the functionality, and it is possible uh, to make a star polymer do that. You can do this with a uh, step growth type mechanism, and it's important in step growth polymerizations to do that. Uh, we mentioned that the strength of polymers in general goes up with their molecular weight, uh, but it turns out it's hard to make a step growth or condensation type polymer to have very high molecular weights. So what you can do is you can make it four functional and then each branch can get to reasonable molecular weights and the overall thing gets to higher molecular weight. And so that's convenient. Also, the viscosity properties of uh, star polymers is quite different from normal polymers. So that's uh, actually an important uh, uh, thing to do. And so if you buy higher grades of motor oil, you may start seeing various branch type polymers in there. Okay. All right. Uh, what does it mean to have them behave a little bit like spheres? Well, it turns out that spheres are not really good at adding viscosity to fluids. Okay. Uh, on a unit mass basis. If you look at how much viscosity you add to a fluid by unit mass, a sphere is not the way to go. Adding in sphere is not the way to go. Per unit mass, you get a lot more viscosity out of polymers. Okay. All right, so this is one of the masters of these star polymers and letter polymers, this guy named Jimmy Mays, uh, who is retired because uh, he became a very accomplished chemist. Uh, he was he is pictured there at University of Tennessee uh, making a very handsome salary as a governor's professor. And, uh, but it wasn't enough. Uh, they gave him a, a huge giant lab and uh, he, he got into the litigation game. And uh, so, you know, as some of you are looking at careers. I, I think it's, he, this is a guy who really is a scientist, and, uh, but he's probably superb on a, as an expert witness on a, a jury, because he's got that all shucks, good old boy from Mississippi type talk. And uh, he's a great guy. Um, and he can make uh, polymers of almost any shape you want, okay? And uh, so that's actually interesting, again, for viscosity control, but also so for sort of testing various theories. So he, he kind of straddles theory and experiment very well. Uh, he is, I think, just recently retired uh, one of his two houses in Florida, the other one's up in Maine. Um, so uh, anyway, um, uh, another kinds of polymers you make are sort of named what they look like, uh, combs and bottle brushes and ladders. Uh, all of these are various ways to, to tune the shape and the properties. Uh, turns out that, uh, again, you, you know, uh, if you put a lot of these side chains on, on this, if we look at this thing here for, uh, I should really get a pointer going here, oh, great. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get a pointer another way. Laser pointer. Okay, so uh, if I uh, look along this uh, bottle brush palm, and one of the things that's cool about it is I can make that pretty much in the same factory that I've been talking about, um, or the same chemistry, basically. Uh, but if I put a lot of these uh, side chains on it, it can't get all floppy on me. Okay, and it becomes more stiff. Normal polymers are pretty floppy. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So uh, these are ways to make uh, sort of more rigid polymers, and uh, they have applications too. They're stronger per unit mass. They viscosify better per unit mass, and some of them make liquid crystals, which is obviously useful. 
Uh, dendromers. Uh, dendromers is another kind of branched polymer, and this one starts um, with uh, a three function. And uh, watch what happens each generation. Uh, you add something. And I add uh, kind of a different chevron. So if I go back, I'm going to add like a, a you know a wing, <laughs> a wing shaped thing over here. I'll add something like that. And uh, so there's one. Now I add another wing. And if you work the math on that, they double in mass every time you do that. If you keep doing that, the surface gets crowded. And then that means you can trap something inside of it. So these things are ways to make, uh, what you like to do is to sort of trap something inside, maybe for drug delivery or delivering other things. Uh, you know, very nice uh, to be able to deliver chemicals where you want them to go. Okay. Uh, I think the example here shows a, a half of a dendromer. Okay, so this is sort of like a tree-shaped molecule. There's the tree trunk and there's the rest. Rod-like polymers, um, various ways to make rod-like polymers. Uh, those of you with a little bit of organic chemistry background will know that this thing lays out flat like a ribbon. Okay, and it really lays like a ribbon. I can have a little bit of a uh, bond rotation flip um, here. I can actually flip a little bit around that bond there. I can rotate. You know that benzene group can sort of flip there, uh, but it's uh, still got a you know sort of a straight through bond angle. I can have a little bending. You can make this. You know I could try to bend this down oh, just a little bit by thermal agitation. Okay, I could bend that down a little bit, and that would give me a little bit of bend, um, but not much. I could bend it up out of the plane of the screen there, uh, but not much. And so these are these are pretty rigid type molecules, and uh, uh, they make very strong fibers as a result. You know, to, to break a fiber made of that stuff, you have to break all those bonds, and that ain't easy. Uh, on a per mass basis, they're stronger than steel. Um, so uh, that's cool for if you're making an airplane. You want to be lightweight and strong. Uh, they also have interesting radar absorptive type properties. I'm still not exactly sure if that worked out exactly for that particular one or they're using something else. I, it's not my area uh, anymore. I kind of was in that area for a while. Another way to make uh, rods is to make a spring. Okay, so it's kind of kind of sounds crazy. Uh, these coil shaped things. Um, you know, if I make a spring coil, like a coil spring in a car, uh, that tends to lay out straight too. It has poor elongational modulus. You can stretch that. You can sort of stretch that string out um, pretty easily. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of bending rigidity, it's actually more rigid than the, the ribbon type thing. Okay, so if I wanted to just sort of, you know, it's hard to make it do this flexural modulus is high. And a poor elongational modulus, this one has a superb elongational Okay, um, polyelectrolytes, uh, any polymer that carries a lot of charge. Um, if you think about it, um, it's kind of remarkable that you can make these at all. Okay, uh, so I'm going to draw polystyrene sulfonate. And we'll put an SO3 here and an SO3 here. And we'll try to kind of just make a guess at how far apart those are. You know, I don't really know how far they are apart, but we can. Oh, I was asking you still tell you about angstroms. Okay, hopefully, yes. Uh, bonds are like 1.5 angstroms here for the carbon bonds. 
and uh, you know you got two of them there so you can kind of figure out you know how far apart that is but anyway it's, it's only you know it's like I don't know two or three angstroms four or five angstroms let's say let's say let's just you know depends on where the sulfonate groups if it goes off on here if it goes off on there it depends on how these benzene rings are flipping around a little bit you know so but let's just say you know four angstroms and you put that charge this is an electron you know you put that charge and you calculate the coulomb's force in q1 q2 the okay four pi epsilon naught r squared and you set r to four angstroms well that's going to be a large force <laughs> so so but amazingly you can do that and uh uh, amazingly, those polymers uh, do not go completely straight because what happens is uh, they attract a lot of these things, sodium ions and hydronium ions from the water, come and sit down and partially neutralize this effect. Okay. Uh, anyway, these are very complicated materials, but they have a lot of practical applications. Okay. Uh, uh, sodium polystyrene sulfonate is used in making uh, OLED devices and other photochromic type devices. Um, it's not the primary component of there in those situations, but it's an important component. Um, and it also, um, you can think about the oppositely charged things, poly cations. Uh, these are used usually in, in a lot of uh, applications. So you want to clean up for environmental cleanup, for example, those are very valuable. And also, they turn out to be reasonably good disinfectants. Okay. Ah, biopolymers. I think we'll do is take a quick break here and let me get a recharge.